many of you may know um, William Hosley. He's a cultural and resource development and marketing consultant. Um, of course, he has a deep passion for local history and historic preservation. And he was formerly the director of the New Haven Museum and Connecticut Landmarks, where he cared for a chain of historic attractions. Um, prior to that, as curator and exhibit developer at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, Bill organized major exhibits, including the Great River, Art and Society of the Connecticut Valley, the Japan Idea, Art and Life in Victorian America, and Sam and Elizabeth, Legend and Legacy of Colt's Empire. Um, and Bill has studied, lectured, and advised museums and heritage destinations around the country. Um, we are so excited to have um, Bill here kicking off our series on uh, cemeteries. Um, and what better, what better person to do that? <laughs> so Bill, thank you so much for being here tonight. Great, I love Litchfield. You're, you guys do wonderful things. And, and so it's a pleasure. We spent a fair amount of time out in Litchfield County during the past year uh, doing some of the work for this. So it, it, it's uh, gonna be, you'll see some familiar stuff. And so I'll get right into it. Uh, more right, than and museums, I'm just gonna turn myself off to give you the, to give you the stage. Oh, oh yeah, mute. <laughs> there we go. More than museums, more than historic districts and more than most classrooms, the world of gravestones, cemeteries and monuments is the place where art and history meet. I was first drawn into this world of words and symbols etched in stone road tripping around Vermont. The world of gravestone cemeteries and monuments is endlessly fascinating and has taught me more about people, places, and art than any other facet of my education. The best part is that Connecticut is a remarkable location for gravestone studies. There is no better place for exploring America's contribution. The whole story of American art and sculpture unfolds right here, starting with the first glimmering of the craft and industry in Windsor and Middletown in the 1660s, evolving into uh, florid and prolifically inventive expressions of American folk art in the mid 1700s and then culminating in the 19th century with the emergence of a major industry characterized by Connecticut's famous combination of technology, mass marketing and know-how. The variety and quality of expression is endless. Let me see, okay. Um, well, so here we are, what a year it's been. Uh, nobody will miss 2020 too much, uh, but uh, as a little backstory, my wife, uh, Christine Ermentz, retired as the director of the Windsor Historical Society at the end of February. The pandemic hit two weeks later, and suddenly we were hibernating in lockdown, like many of you, with any social or travel plans for the year upended. Uh, we started visiting and photographing cemeteries and burying grounds, something we've loved to do, uh, but now more intensively. By the end of 2020, we'd visited at least 80 sites in Connecticut, Western Mass and Southern Vermont, and added thousands of pictures to our archive. As students of material culture and local history, this was a deep dive like nothing we'd ever done or had time to do before. Well, what we discovered was a revelation, and that's uh, me on the left there. In order to get a good picture of a table stone, you got to get up over it. That's hard to do. So we had a ladder in the back of the car. We actually uh, cranked out an article for Antiques and Fine Art magazine, came out in the month of December about our uh, adventures, and it was fun to get something uh, in print about that. Um, so we visited burying grounds and cemeteries, and here in Litchfield, we visited East Cemetery, West Cemetery, and a burying ground in Milton uh, by a, a, a river or brook there where we had our little uh, socially distanced lunch. <laughs> and you don't meet too many people when you're wandering around graveyards, so it's a perfect thing uh, with the pandemic. Uh, some of our most exciting discoveries, some of the most beautiful sites are in places that don't get a lot of tourism traffic, like Hampton in Wyndham County, Eastern Connecticut, uh, and Long Hill Bearing Ground in Shelton, the eastern edge of Fairfield County along the Housatonic River. And New Milford has amazing stuff. 
Connecticut has 169 towns. On average, there are between three and four burying grounds or cemeteries in each town uh, with 17th, 18th, and 19th century markers and monuments. Without Ancestry.com's Find a Grave, uh, which is a website, you can look it up with its millions of searchable entries, citations, and photographs and maps, our project would not have been possible. Some of the sites are way off the beaten path and, uh, and some with beautiful topography, plannings, iron fencing. This is more than where more than half the art in the state is located and in no category of art is Connecticut's role of greater national stature. It's a cultural asset the tourism industry barely knows exists and yet folks from all over the country visit Connecticut for its history. Um, some of the sites are rustic and informal, the ones I just showed. Others like Elm Grove in Mystic, God's Little Acre in East Windsor, and the epic entrance in Simsbury are grandiose. We often co crossed paths with others doing what we were doing, locals and some who traveled halfway across the country to see these treasures. It's a growing thing that was a perfect thing for social distancing. The ancient burying ground in Hartford, where I did a lot of work uh, at one point, wrote a book about it, has been a model of care and public engagement. Grove Street Cemetery in New Haven is a national historic landmark, surrounded on all sides by Yale and brimming with art and statuary going back to the 1730s. Mountain Grove Cemetery in Bridgeport is one of the fascinating cultural treasures there. And we'll see more things from these places in a moment. And one of my favorites is Riverside Cemetery in Waterbury, a veritable sculpture park loaded with history. So uh, Connecticut, it, it's interesting, you know, this little state, you could almost anywhere you live, you can be anywhere else in the state in an hour, maybe a little more, but you know, everything's close. Uh, I always, my tagline for Connecticut is so much, so close. And that's true, there's a lot here and we're not far from things just over the line in New York, Vermont, Massachusetts, great place to live. So uh, it's interesting that Connecticut, as small as it is, is very diverse. We have 169 towns, but the geology is really distinctive. And, um, you know, basically uh, in the Connecticut River Valley in the center there, we have brownstone, a sedimentary rock. Uh, we'll talk more about that, uh, used as a building stone during the Gilded Age um, as far as Brooklyn and New York City and shift as far as San Francisco. So the brownstone actually was one of the first export industries in the st state of Connecticut. In fact, in Boston, they called it Connecticut stone because it was uh, uh, a material that they didn't have in Massachusetts. And you can see here, uh, this is uh, Middletown. Uh, the old uh, Portland brownstone quarry is now a uh, outdoor recreation kind of a attraction. It's really very interesting what they've done with it. But the brownstone business for like 250 years was big and thriving and located most of the largest part of it was right there in, in Middletown. As early as the 1660s, the Griswold family in Windsor, these are examples of their work. Uh, pretty amazing stuff uh, that was kind of Puritan plain style, not lots of bells and whistles, not lots of decoration, but this is where the business starts. And then the Stancliffs family in uh, Middletown uh, all made these gravestones very early, as early as the 17th and early 18th century. So they're, they're plain at first, uh, but the next generation in Middletown, the Johnson family, uh, which operated, I think there were three generations of them uh, that continued into the early 19th century, uh, making these little death heads like the example on the left and on the right in the town of Durham, uh, actually made and signed at the very bottom there by Thomas Johnson, who was a member of that dynast dynasty and, and did great stuff. And um, producing some beautiful work like this stone in Durham, marking the grave of Nathan and Rhoda Camp. I mean, just the ornamentation, brownstone's soft, so I guess it, it's a little easier to carve than granite or slate. But uh, some of these 
uh, 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 gravestones again are um, really incredible, distinctive works of art. Um, on the left is in also in Durham, Connecticut, and on the right with those wonderful rosettes and big scrolls is in Suffield. Um, brownstone is relatively soft and lends itself to carving in the most intricate patterns, winged angels, soul effigies, urns, willows, flowers, you name it, uh, and uh, it can be done. And, uh, and there were dozens of stonecutters who uh, worked this material in the Connecticut Valley. Many of them over the past 50 years have been identified. There are ways of documenting who, the, sometimes they sign the gravestones, other times there are payments you'll find in probate records. There are various ways of documenting who made this stuff, but uh, not all of them are known by name, but many are. And I love the uh, man and his wife in the center there. You can see her little gold necklace. Uh, they, they didn't leave fashion out. These aren't exact portraits, but they're pretty darn close and pretty interesting. Um, these two from Enfield and North Brantford. Uh, they, they, uh, uh, were, there were dozens of stone carters, again, working in the Connecticut Valley. The variety is very distinctive. What you see here are uh, uh, vine, the vine and leaf carving on the left, and then looks like tobacco leaves on the border on the gravestone in Enfield, Connecticut, or Suffield, Connecticut on the uh, right. And uh, the, these two also from Enfield and North Brantford, there again were many different stone cutters and, um, uh, and you can see that the styles are almost as distinctive as a thumbprint. I love these portrait stones, Isaac uh, Ingraham uh, on the right in Bristol and uh, Submit, how's that for a name? Mitt Chittenden in North Guilford. So these are some of the figures. Now, uh, table stones like these were by far the most costly form of monument. They often get overlooked because they have more words than symbols, but the words tell Connecticut stories, often marking the graves of prominent ministers, merchants, and military leaders like Colonel Elisha Williams of Weathersfield shown on the right. And, you know, again, <clears throat> You saw that picture earlier of me up on the ladder. It is really difficult to photograph these table stones. Uh, in fact, you almost never see them published because until I got up on a ladder, I wasn't even sure how to do it. But I think you can read this. And th this is what they look like when you approach them on the left here in the yard. They've got those fluted, beautiful carved, decorated legs and these incredibly heavy tops. Um, the uplands of eastern Connecticut are known for an entirely different kind of stone, a metamorphic rock known as schist. The late Yukon professor James Slater wrote the best book on any aspect of Connecticut gravestones. Uh, one of his protégés, Ruth Shapley Brown on the lower left there, <coughs> founded the Connecticut Gravestone Network. In the 1950s, lower right, Dr. Ernest Caulfield published a series of articles on Connecticut gravestones in the Connecticut Historical Society Bulletin. So there is literature on this subject, but a lot of what I'm showing you is stuff you won't find in books anywhere. Um, and it's great stuff. Um, this is in Mansfield, just a, a, a ambient view of the burying ground in Mansfield where the Yukon is located. From a folk art perspective, the Eastern Connecticut stone carters produce some of the most exciting work in colonial America. Among the first to work this material were Benjamin Collins on the right, left from Lebanon, of Norwich on the right. And again, you can see how different one stone cutter is. It's just like any kind of artist, they, they try to put their uh, imprimatur, their, 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 their identity in the style of what, what, what they do. Um, and uh, this um, is Gershom Bartlett. He was in Bolton, Connecticut, and he was arguably the most prolific stone cutter in Eastern Connecticut. He, his work is, look, you can find it in Massachusetts, Vermont, Connecticut. So some of these fellows were pretty entrepreneurial and they call him the hook and eye man because the eye and the 
looks like a little fish hook the way the eye and the nose is made. The one on the right looks like, I don't know what that is. He's got strawberries growing out of his ears. But you can tell the border patterns will be the same one to the next. And, and he's got, again, that, that uh, very uh, distinctive look. Um, and uh, the other family, uh, 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 really important were the of uh, Norwich and Lebanon. And again, their work is on the same material schist, which, by the way, holds up a lot brownstone brownstone we'll get into that toward the end uh has some conservation and sustainability issues you could call it the schist is really in good shape and uh these are examples from mansfield the little town of franklin i wonder if anybody watching this been in franklin connecticut but boy do they have fantastic things and look at gravestone on the left miss daniel squire Sacred to the memory, uh, 1780. And then on the right is a mother. So a lot to think about. And uh, these are also examples of work. Um, uh, the one on the right, Jabez Perkins was lost in a hurricane at sea on October the 4th, 1780. Boy, there's got to be a backstory to that. Everybody in Norwich probably knew the story at the time. John Walden uh, from Wyndham was a gravestone cutter also out in Eastern Connecticut who liked to imitate what the Mannings were doing. So they sometimes call him an imitator, but he also signed his gravestones, which is always fun. Then in Western Connecticut, Litchfield County, the big story is marble. That's not all you find out there, but that's the real distinctive contribution the Litchfield Hills made to the story of gravestones. And it's interesting that this marble belt continues from almost the Canadian border all the way down to central Connecticut. If you can see the map on the right, uh, it shows where the uh, marble corridor was located. And uh, makers began advertising in the Litchfield newspapers in the 1790s and early 1800s. And even today, there are still active quarries. You can see the little square map in the center there shows quarrying sites, mostly up around Canaan. Uh, and, uh, but so, you know, the marble bed continues, but it's not, not much in the way of monuments and gravestones being made here anymore. Um, these show advertisements from the Litchfield newspapers from the 1790s and 1802. Individuals, I don't know anything, maybe the, our friends at Litchfield Historical can tell us something about Timothy Foote. I don't know much about him, but <laughs> he, he made white and blue marble stone for monuments and building. These are simple little ads in the Litchfield papers early on. Well, marble, when they discovered it in the 1790s, became a very big deal because it was kind of related to the founding of our new nation, the looking back to the classics in Rome and Greece and that purity of white color that they loved. And so marble began to had more status in a way than brownstone after a, a point and and some really great stuff mostly after 1800 the general phelps stone on the left there from 1809 is in uh, simsbury and uh the upson stone on the right is in bristol and this is great i fished this out of the litchfield papers an article talking about the, uh, all this huge uh, economic opportunity for Connecticut, uh, where they described it as containing the finest specimens of marble in the world. Well, that might be an exaggeration, but who knows? So celebrated as unsurpassed in quality and variety, the writer says is exceeding in every respect by that of any anywhere else in New England. And they thought there might be seven million dollars. You know, this is in the 1830s worth of uh, marble to uh, be excavated in, in, in the, re the region. Um, the uh, canals and railroads also made it practical to move stone cutting operations to cities like New Haven and Hartford. David uh, Ritter and his son John shown here were one of the most prolific and successful uh, monument uh, companies uh, they were based in New Haven. I love the graphic that they used on the lower right there for advertising. Uh, you can see that the, the, his yard, his uh, shop is located right adjacent to the canal. So the idea is that 
we can ship it. And uh, they did. And then the Sun, they continued in business for almost 70 years. Uh, up in uh, Hartford, there was Thomas Adams, who shipped finished products made of Connecticut marble as far away as South Carolina. Most gravestones aren't signed, but this one in Simsbury was. You can see T. Adams, Hartford above. And uh, so I, we always like to see those. Uh, the uh, James Batterson started out with his father in the South Farm section of Litch New Preston, best known as the founder of Travelers Insurance Company. He started out working marble in the Litchfield Hills as a teenager, apprenticing to his father, moved his business to Hartford in 1844, and became a major player in the monument industry nationally. And this is one of his ads, one of his monuments, the interior view of his shop, which is amazing. Uh, the um, uh, Batterson made with uh, the Tomlinsons had quarries up in uh, New Preston and together they collaborated on this tablet for the Washington Monument. That's a whole lecture in itself. But if you ever, if we ever get back to Washington and the pandemic's over and you can take a tour, it's one of the coolest things to do in the capital city is the walk down the uh, Washington Monument tour. And you see all these commemorative tablets from the 1840s, 30s. This is the one that Connecticut produced uh, for, by the Sons of Temperance. So they were trying to get everybody to stop drinking, I guess. Um, and uh, Batterson also made national news in 1854 ma by making the David Worcester Monument in Danbury. And this was like the, the biggest, flashiest thing anybody had ever seen prior to the Civil War. It's an amazing treasure and it's actually in a cemetery it's not really a grave marker uh, 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 Worcester is elsewhere but this is a memorial to him he was one of the highest ranking generals in the American Revolution marble as marble became increasingly fashionable stone cutters in eastern Connecticut imported stone from western Connecticut to keep up with fashion and that may be one of the mannings on the left it's marble but it's not eastern Connecticut marble because they don't they don't grow it out there. Um, and uh, Fenton Williams from Torrington has done more research than anyone on the marble industry of Western Com Connecticut. Much work still to be done. Very little of this has been published. Many stone cutters to identify. Again, these are examples. And sometimes the marble, you know, when it's new, it's shine, it's br it's smooth, it's white, it's clean. But these are artifacts that in many cases are two hundred years old and so they, they sometimes get dirty and th there's other aspects of wear and you know that that you know what you're seeing might not be exactly what they saw when it was new this is one of my favorite gravestones in Harwinton uh not far from Litchfield and it is it might have been imported made in 1806 might have been imported from the Berkshires so uh, there were the, the marble quarries went from central western Connecticut all the way up into Vermont. And I think some of the makers in the Berkshires uh, 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 were pretty successful. And I, I feel like I've seen this. I'm not sure who made this, but I've seen work examples by this person in Pittsfield, Great Barrington, and elsewhere. And there's a, a, a good chance that, that uh, they were uh, made there. Um, and again, uh, 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 although most of the Connecticut marble post dates 1800, the variety of styles and decoration is remarkable. The gravestone on the right there shows a minister at his pulpit. It's up in Salisbury. Pretty neat stuff. Uh, the, um, the big ticket item in this period were not table stones, but these obelisks inspired by late 18th century Egyptian archaeology. Uh, from left to right is the Canfield in New Milford from 1799, Levitt family uh, from 1807 in Bethlehem, and then Porter uh, family in, in uh, Sharon on, 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 on the right. And these were all marble and bigger. Uh, another thing you, you, you find in uh, cemeteries and burying grounds is ironwork. Some of this ironwork was actually produced in Connecticut, but the fencing and 
sometimes families would have individual, like you can see on the top there, uh, like a family, like a fenced in plot for their family where there'd be multiple stones. And it's just the, the, the ornamentation, the decoration, the beautiful work in iron. Then in uh, bronze, um, after the Civil War, demand for cast bronze statuary and monuments found its way into cemeteries. Some of the leading artist sculptors, as they were now called, traced their roots and early training back to the quarries in the Litchfield Hills. Hartford on the left, Waterbury on the right. This is uh, Waterbury on the left and upper right. And then Horace Wells, the discoverer of anesthesia, dentist, uh, famous. You can Google Horace Wells and that's his monument with bronze plaques and panels in Cedar Hill Cemetery in Hartford. Um, then this is the coolest story to me uh, in Connecticut. Leave it to Connecticut to figure out how to mass produce the popular new thing using interchangeable molds. Uh, this work made of zinc by the Monumental Bronze Company in Bridgeport became wildly popular in the 1880s and uh, 90s and was distributed nationally. And the, the incredible, the stuff is in amazing condition usually when you find it. There are some problems, but but these are beautiful works. And in the center there is a trade catalog that is online. And you can see pretty much the figure that's on the left. Uh, uh, and it, uh, uh, the, you know, you, you would order this stuff from a catalog, but the, no two are identical. And they're all so terribly interesting. The same company also uh, made um, Civil War monuments like this one in Stratford, Connecticut, which is, you know, maybe the most grandiose thing this firm ever produced. It's 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 really really outstanding. Um, so then there's the the history aspect, and you know every graveyard there. You know today with Ancestry.com and all the genealogical search tools that exist, it's not that difficult to get a backstory to learn something about the people whose gravestones might interest you. And uh, we've been doing more and more of that. My wife, uh, Christine Ermentz, and I both post on Facebook uh, pictures of gravestones we see and sometimes backstories that we research. It's been great fun to do. Uh, these are two stones from Coventry, Connecticut. On the left is Esther Meacham. And without reading the whole thing, she is famous because she was one of the captives who was taken to Canada after the raid on Deerfield in 1704. The raid on Deerfield Mass in 1704 was the biggest news event of the uh, colonial period in, in Connecticut uh, and Massachusetts. I mean, it really made international news. So everybody knew she, she eventually came back. She married the town minister in uh, Coventry, but everybody knew that she'd been one of the the captives that was taken to Canada. On the right is what they call a cenotaph. It, it doesn't mark the grave because Nathan Hale isn't buried in Connecticut. He's somewhere in New York City, I guess. But uh, the family, about 20 years after he died, decided to commission this monument to tell his story. Nathan Hale is Connecticut state hero and patriot. And it's pretty cool to stumble on these history stones that tell a story. There's so much American revolutionary story uh, stories on, in gravestones scattered around uh, Connecticut. Um, you know, sometimes you discover very specific references to uh, battles. Uh, uh, this fellow in the middle there, Colonel Giles Russell, who I'm sure we could research, lost, uh, departed this life at Danbury, September 1779. Well, that was when the Brits were coming after Danbury and Ridgefield, and it was one of the more dramatic events of the American Revolution. And then on the right, Timothy Taylor, that's da also down in Danbury, but lots of uh, text, lots of information that you can interpret. And again, I think graveyard tours are amazing for that re uh, reason. There's a lot, just like a collection in a museum, uh, interpretations key. On the left is Dr. Abijah Perkins. This is in the little town of Hanover, Connecticut, uh, who uh, endured imprisonment 
chains, hunger, and barbarous insults of the cruel Britons. Sounds like they were still angry in 1782. Uh, and because uh, on the right is Joseph Lewis, who died at the Battle of Groton Heights, which is uh, by the traitor Arnold, referring to Benedict Arnold as a murderer and his murdering corps. So there's a lot, this is pretty amazing history. If you're interested in the history of Freemasonry, the Masonic order, uh, uh, there are gravestones that speak to that. These are, uh, they're both in Simsbury actually. And you've got all the symbolism of the Masons. And again, these are uh, late 18th century. And then I love this. This is another case where I got up on the ladder to photograph Reverend Timothy Edwards table stone in Old East Windsor. Uh, he was the minister uh, of uh, the uh, Congregational Church there. He died in 1758. Interestingly, the same year as his much more famous son, Jonathan Edwards was the most important figure in 18th century America in terms of our religious history. It's, it would be hard to overstate his importance in American life and letters. And his father was the reverend on the left and his mother buried right next to him, Esther Edwards. And I love the way the gravestone refers to her as the, lest we forget it, she was the wife of Reverend Timothy Edwards, but even more importantly, she was the daughter of the Reverend uh, uh, Solomon Stoddard of Northampton. And uh, that's a gravestone, by the way, by Gershom Bartlett. So uh, Jonathan Edwards had an epic pedigree uh, for getting into the ministry, and he did something with it. And this table stone is, is, is amazing. This is one of my favorites when I've given tours of the ancient burying ground in Hartford. I always love pointing out uh, this amazing uh, gravestone in Schist from Eastern Connecticut. It marks the grave of Captain Israel Seymour, who was killed by lightning in 1784. And the news accounts in the newspapers talk about how he was, it was a big thunderstorm and he's standing in the door of his house, if you believe this, standing in the door of his house and the lightning hit the chimney and worked its way down through the frame, exploded the door that he was standing in and killed him. It's, and, and his shoes were blown off. I mean, it all sounds almost like uh, something out of a movie, but nonetheless, uh, he was important. The sermons that weekend reminded everybody to be prepared because you never know when your number's up. Well, the other thing about Israel Seymour is he manufactured redware. He was a potter. That's one of his advertisements in the Hartford Current from uh, oh boy, just a few months before he was killed. Uh, famous, you know, all of these stories can be researched. I, I don't know a whole lot about honor Honorable Erastus Wolcott, but it tells you right on his gravestone, he was a judge of the Superior Court, a general in the army of the late war, that would have been the revolution. He was a sincere friend of religion and filled up his important life, his important life with usefulness to mankind. Uh, I wish it all be so fortunate as to have people say that about us. He died in 1793. Next to him on the right there is Nathan Beer Beers in New Haven, who uh, his, was killed when the British invaded his house during the 1779 uh, a British landing and attack on New Haven. And that's a whole piece of our Rev War drama that most people probably don't, don't know. Um, New London is... In 18th century, New London was in some ways our most cosmopolitan city. They were involved in international trade and there were people from all over the Europe and other parts of the world and the West Indies and the islands that lived there or worked there, uh, see, see maritime community. And uh, what we see there uh, on the left is a gravestone that refers to James Farley on the island of Antigua, which is down near Bermuda. What was uh, he doing there? Well, probably these were sugar plantations. And of course, the story of slavery is tied in with that. Then in the center, lower center is Henrietta Brown, late of St. Vincent, also in the Caribbean. Uh, on the right is a monument 
talking about the biggest maritime disaster prior to the Titanic, which was this, uh, the loss of the steamer Atlantic off of Fisher's Island in 1846. So, and then an upper right, a, uh, a, 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 a group of 19th century members of the Jewish community in New London. So a lot of diversity, French, Spanish, the islands, African-Americans all located there. And, you know, the maritime, I live in the interior of Connecticut. I've never lived anywhere on the coast. So I don't think about the maritime world as much, but it's it's real important down there. And if you, again, in New London, you, you can see gravestones with uh, clipper ships and whaling vessels uh, actually engraved on them. And then I love this fella, Coddington Fish, <laughs> who drowned in Long Island Sound. Well, we can be pretty sure his nickname was Codfish. Uh, so they had o oceans on the mind and too bad uh, that he was 45 years old. How he drowned in Long Island Sound, we don't get to know, but this is in New London. And, uh, you know, and again, the uh, connections to the West Indies and uh, merchant travel are extensive on, on, on these gravestones. These are a couple stones marking the grave of students at Yale. And in the 18th century, was it one tenth of 1% of families sent their children off to college? I mean, basically nobody went to college. Um, uh, most people didn't even have the equivalent of what we'd call a high school education. But those who fitted up for college uh, usually studied with a, the town minister and then would matriculate into Yale. Uh, so it was the only college in the state through most of the 18th century, all of the 18th century. And, uh, you know, uh, you learned Latin and the curriculum was uh, four years and most of the students became clergymen, though many also became merchants and had other uh, lines of work they were involved in. Gravestones also often tell the story of how someone died. Lots of medical history on the left uh, from uh, uh, from water, I don't think, is that in Waterbury? Uh, anyway, anyway, it's uh, Seth Preston it, it died of smallpox in 1777. And then on the right, Captain, Captain Amos Snow uh, fell off a bridge in Springfield. Uh, he This is out in Eastern Connecticut. I don't know why he fell off a bridge, uh, but uh, these are the stories you sometimes get. One of my favorite discoveries of the past year was out in the little town of Columbia, Connecticut, which was originally a section of Lebanon. And uh, this marks the grave on the left of uh, Sarah Davenport Wheelock. She died in 1746 and she was the wife of Reverend Ebenezer Wheelock, shown on the right. Now Ebenezer Wheelock started an Indian school, a school for educating in the Christian faith and Western uh, knowledge, uh, it, Native Americans. Uh, and his Indian school founded in, in part of Lebanon, uh, eventually moved north and became Dartmouth College. And so uh, that's a big deal. So her husband, she was the first wife. She died at 44. He remarried, moved up to Hanover, New Hampshire. But the, the interesting thing about Sarah Davenport Wheelock is that the coat of arms, which you almost never see, even, even less often on women's gravestones, a family crest, a coat of arms like this. And it's not the Wheelock coat of arms, it's the Davenport co coat of arms because her great grandfather was like the founder of New Haven. And so even in death, she wanted to, you know, know that she may have been Eliezer Wheelock's wife, but more importantly, she was a Davenport. So there you go. Uh, and the same probably applied to the Salton Stalls, one of the Governor G Gurdon Salton Stall buried in New London there. It's another one with a coat of arms, uh, one of the richest uh, families in early 18th century Connecticut. Um, as early as the 1830s, John Warner Barber, who wrote the famous illustrated history of Connecticut in the 1830s, included a woodcut picture on the lower left there of tourists visiting the gravesite of Jonathan, Governor Jonathan Trumbull. 
the wartime governor friend of Washington, Franklin. Uh, you know, he he was a major player in the American Revolution, and he was the only colonial governor who was elected governor of a new state once the United States. So he was the first governor of Connecticut and the last governor of the colony of Connecticut. And he's buried in Lebanon. And, and right in Litchfield, you've got the Honorable Benjamin Talmadge detail on the lower left of the Ralph Earl portrait at the Litchfield Historical Society. And boy, that's a chunk of marble for you. Um, and he was a member of the Society of Cincinnati, the officer core of the George Washington's officers from the American Revolution. And uh, that was a very high prestige thing on the Ralph Earl portrait. He's wearing a Society of Cincinnati pin. And then they've added these uh, plaques uh, for the Society of Cincinnati to his monument. He died in 1835. He was also, interestingly enough, a classmate with Nathan Hale at Yale and one of George Washington's original spy masters. So obviously people in Litchfield know more about Benjamin Talmadge than I do, but great, great stuff. Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, developed interchangeable parts for firearms manufacturing, one of the inventive geniuses in Connecticut history. This is in Grove Street Cemetery in New Haven. And then Sam Colt himself actually designed with James Batterson this gravestone about 1855 that is an old North Cemetery in Hartford, but he's not buried there. By the time he died in 1862, his wife, his widow, had other ideas. And she engaged James Batterson again to do this incredible red imported Scottish red granite. It's about probably the most opulent thing that anyone had ever seen in Connecticut, the way of grave markers in uh, 1864 or five, I think was when it was completed. And it includes a bronze figure of the angel Gabriel and the Colt family coat of arms. So that's all pretty cool. And then also in, that's in Cedar Hill Cemetery in Hartford, also in Cedar Hill, Cemetery was the uh, 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 Jeff Bezos of the uh, 19th century or early 20th century, J.P. Morgan, richest man in America and uh, born in Hartford, buried in Hartford. And look at that arc. That thing will be here a thousand years from now. It's in Cedar Hill. And it, it's pretty amazing. Aesthetic movement style. It's uh, great. So these are personalities. Uh, African Americans were not a s s large proportion of the population of Connecticut in the 18th century and early 19th century, but there were some great stories. Venture Smith, you can Google him. He was an African, uh, an African king, uh, kidnapped, kidnapped and sold into slavery, and through his hard work, he purchased his freedom. Uh, Venture Smith is an epic figure. Died in 1805. Uh, he has connections to Stonington and East Haddam, where he's buried. And then on the right is a one of the black governors, one of the African governors uh, in Norwich, Connecticut. And that's a whole story unto itself. 1772, it marks the grave of a uh, enslaved uh, man named Boston Troutrow. Uh, also on the theme of uh, African-American history, this was Lewis Ledyard Weld, who was lieutenant Colonel of the U.S. Colored Troops in the Civil War, also made by the Batterson firm. It's an Old North Cemetery in Hartford. And on the left is a gravestone marking the grave of a man, uh, Joseph Hendrahand, born in slavery in Washington, North Carolina, died in the service of his country, a free man at a uh, hospital in um, Chelsea Hospital in Massachusetts during the Civil War. So that's a patriotic feeling of a, a man born in slavery, but who wrestled at his freedom. And then on the right, our gravestones are about 50 uh, Civil War veterans, Black Civil War veterans buried in Old North Cemetery. And uh, those are some of their gravestones. Now, I love this. This is out in uh, Brooklyn, Connecticut, and it marks the grave of Mary, wife of Francois Leroy, a French gentleman. 
She died in August, 1792. And it's so sweet, the flower and the vine. And who is Francois Leroy, a French gentleman? Well, that part of Connecticut saw a lot of French troops during uh, the revolution. Uh, Rochambeau wintered over in um, Lebanon in 1780 en route to Yorktown. And maybe this was a little romance that was uh, uh, kindled up in those days. I don't know. There's not, again, these can all be researched uh, more perhaps than I have. Gravestones uh, on Boston's Freedom Trail, shown in the lower right there, get a million visitors per year. Uh, not during the pandemic, I'm sure, but normally. Nothing going on in the classroom beats what students can learn with a teacher with a good lesson plan. And every school in every town in Connecticut has the opportunity to do this. And the, this shows uh, lower left is a group of Trinity College freshmen. I, I have occasionally done orientation tours for them. And on the right is a group from Capital Community College uh, visiting the ancient burying ground and the Stonefield sculpture in Hartford. And on the right is a tour guide uh, uh, in Old North Cemetery. So great stuff. Now I've been involved in this. I first article I ever wrote was in the late 1970s on gravestones up in Vermont where I live. Now, I've been poking around graveyards for longer than I care to admit. But in the 1980s, I was uh, engaged as the curator for the ancient burying ground. We raised a million dollars to do restoration work uh, and wound up writing a book about it. I mean, a lot of conservation issues everywhere, but uh, we worked with the preservation consultants from Columbia University and the Historic Preservation Office of the state of Connecticut. Uh, some of you may remember Dave Ransom on the upper left or Mary Donahue in the center there. And, uh, you know, we, we treated I don't know, 70, 60, 70 gravestones that needed help, needed work. I worked with uh, John Zito, the uh, uh, monument uh, company in Hartford that did a lot of the restoration work. And this was kind of pioneering work where we would find these basket case gravestones where sections were missing. And we, it's kind of a complicated story, but we would, we would figure out what should have, what probably was there and then replicate it on patching compound. And there's a, you know, a whole story to that, that uh, um, I'm not advancing, why? Oh, oops. Uh, okay, uh, as we have traveled around, is this gonna advance? Uh, hmm. As we have traveled around, I have come to the conclusion that the biggest problem facing gravestones in Connecticut is lichen. There are a lot of stones that are in worse condition, but there are thousands of these works of art that are covered with this organic material. Uh, it's a little complicated. And, you know, I know even, even in Litchfield, I mean, you, the, you know, the East Bering Ground is lovely and there's a lot of cool stuff there, but there are also a lot of trees and the trees create a condition that accelerates the lichen formation. And, the, the, you can see in the picture on the lower right, Thai Tryon from the ancient burying ground, uh, cleaning lichen off stones. And there, it's, it's, it's something that volunteers can do, but they need to be trained by people who have done it and know what they're doing. And we could talk about that uh, offline at some point. But anyway, these are some incredible works of art that you can barely see because they are covered with lichen. And then this is weird. These are two gravestones that were probably made in Middletown, same year by the same maker at the same time. And look at the difference in condition. Uh, M Mabel Russell and undoubtedly her husband on the left there, but you can't tell because the, these brownstone gravestones uh, wick up, they, they absorb moisture. And if there are any fault lines in, this, in, in the granular structure of it, you know, sections will fall off. So this is the depressing stuff one sees. Uh, there are damaged and delaminated stones, um, bad stuff. And then, and then marble, again, it varies from place to place. Marble uh, tends to dissolve in acid rain. If you've got acidic atmosphere, it is bad for marble. And it's like a fizzy in a glass of uh, water. Now, not all marbles do this, but you can see three examples here that are now illegible uh, because of that. And then 
gosh, you got vandalism. This was a picture I took in New London. And, you know, look, I think when kids having beer parties do bad stuff, they should be, they should get in a lot of trouble. And sometimes we take this, don't take this stuff as seriously as I, I, I wish we would. That's vandalism. This also in Nagatuck is vandalism where somebody stripped a bronze tablet off. And we had a situation in Hartford uh, where they stripped off bronze, took it to a, a scrapyard for, you know, 15 bucks. It would cost you a thousand to replicate what's missing to get 15 or $20 in, in scrap metal value. It's, it's pretty outrageous. And, and any other problem is just grounds maintenance. Uh, trees and shrubs that get overgrown and the next thing you know. Um, and look, I, I'm, I'm not wild. I think, I think communities spend too much money cutting grass and not enough money trimming shrubs. I don't think graveyards should look like a putting green. I don't think they, you know, do you cut the grass once in a while? I've seen some beautiful sites where they don't cut the grass at all. And it, it really is not a tragedy, but this is. And, and these are conditions that uh, won't fix themselves by accident. So going forward, uh, Christine and I have, uh, will continue. This has been utterly, as horrible as the pandemic has been, we have had a ball. Again, we spent almost 80 days out on the road poking around. And I hope it, when life gets back to normal, we can do this talk and tour program where I might come to some community which we've studied and we would do a tour of the graveyard followed by a program like this uh, where people could really get, I wanna get people excited about caring for this stuff because uh, ultimately stewardship is the heart of historic preservation. There's no aspect of preservation more important than stewardship, which is care and people care about things they love and they love things they know about. So on that cheerful note, uh, I think that's my presentation. And uh, do we have time for questions or comments? Yeah, I think we can definitely take a couple of questions. Um, folks, if you have questions, feel free to drop them either in the Q&A or the chat feature. Um, and Bill, thank you, that was fascinating. I, I mean, those gravestones are absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful. It, it really, you know, it, it's it's one of it's one of Connecticut's crown jewels. I and mean, we've got a yeah. lot of great local museums, and we've got some wonderful stuff. But you don't find any of, it, especially the early yeah. stuff. You don't find it west of the Hudson River. So when Christine and I were in Brantford the other day, and bumped into these people from Wisconsin, who were just like kids in a candy store. They were so excited to be, we forget, we live here. We forget right. how exciting New England can be. To right. People who don't experience it every day. And it's just, and it's beautiful. Like you said, there's, you know, there's these cemeteries in every community in the state that this is all like, everyone's home has, has some history like this. And some of them are right across the street, practically with literally within walking distance of schools. Yeah. Yep. If I had a magic wand. Uh, some of our great teachers would have a field day with just a little bit of encouragement and training, creating lesson plans. I mean, imagine taking the eighth graders to East Cemetery in Litchfield and saying, look, here are se seven or eight things I want you to think yeah. about. Yeah, we're, and, and we are one of those schools, the, the, um, the West Cemetery is right across the street from the intermediate school. So oh. it is walking distance. Uh, there we um, go. Our, but I don't want to talk, I, I don't want to hog all your time. So why don't I ask some of these questions from our audience? Yeah. Um, here's a good one from Diane who wants to know if there's much known about the iron workers in the cemeteries. Oh, you mean the iron that I showed? Yeah. Yeah, um, I, w uh, that one slide had a, a, a little panel with the name of the Lincoln Iron Works in Hartford. Uh, and so there was a company in Hartford that did ornamental iron work. And I mm. am sure there were others, but maybe not many others. And this is the iron work, a lot of it, some of it comes from Ohio. Some of it comes from uh, other parts of the country. And it, it's, it's, a it's a, I photographed the stuff because it's beautiful, but I haven't studied it. And like the gravestones, most of the iron work is not signed. 
Hmm. I'm trying to get, if anybody goes on my YouTube channel, <clears throat> I made a video. <clears throat> William Hosley is my name and I have a YouTube channel. And I made a video about a iron <clears throat> fence in Winstead that marks the grave of one of the ep one of the key figures in the Amistad drama. And it, oh. it, it's being vandalized and it's it needs help. And mm -hmm. I, I've offered to help them raise money to do it, but so far no nibbles. But it's I mean it's it's the kind of project that would not cost a lot of money mm. to do, but it needs something because it's in bad shape. And yeah. I've made a video. Well, here's a good question from Lynn, who wants to know, um, is there a particular book, including your own, you might suggest a novice read? Um, Great. Yeah, good. Um, trying to think. Alan Ludwig's Graven Images is still one of the best things out there. Um, it's titled Graven Images. Uh, mm. James Slater's book on the Graveyards of Eastern Connecticut. It, okay. is, it, you can find anything on Amazon. And I, I think a used copy might be $30, but not more. And that, that's, that's the best book on any aspect of Connecticut yeah. gravestones. And um, there, there are, there are, there's lots of literature. And I should also mention that the Association for Gravestone Studies is a national organization uh, with membership organization. They have conferences every year. Ruth Brown with her Connecticut yeah. Gravestone Network does programs and activities. So there are lots of ways of getting involved and, and learning more. Um, great. Let's see some other good questions we have here. Um, do you know how one adds info and pictures to find a grave? Uh, well, find a grave, adding pictures to find a grave is pretty easy and self-explanatory, I okay, think. Yeah. I have done a, a few, but not many. Uh, I could add all of this stuff, but I'm so busy gathering it that I haven't done that. And there, find a grave, we could not have done this project without it because the great thing about find a grave is you can go in and search by town for the ah. cemeteries. And then if you go look up Litchfield, it'll tell you anywhere, everywhere, there are gravestones in Litchfield. And then it's got a map. So if you want to find that place, you, you can do it. And typically when we would do a day trip, we'd go out on sunny days. When we do a day trip, by the way, that's Christine and I on the left. Oh, <laughs> Nobody's asking. This thing is insane. It's in Bridgeport. And it's made yeah. out of what was left of a tree. So it won't be there forever. And it's a chair. It's like a little throne. And uh, that's incredible. It is incredible. That's really incredible. So there, <laughs> there we go. And uh, but uh, so you can go in to find a grave. And what we would typically do if we had a sunny day when we knew we could get good pictures and mm -hmm. that itself is a whole art in itself. We would um, plan out an itinerary in advance using find a grave. We'd take a part of Connecticut. And we'd say maybe we could. And there were days when we picked off some, some days we would get to locations as early as 8 a.m. Wow. And act, actually to photograph table stones, it's helpful like right at sunrise. So, I mean, one time, I think we got to Weathersfield at 7 a.m. to get certain kind of quality right that matters. And uh, find a grave was great. And there were days when we picked off seven mm -hmm. or eight graveyards in one Day. Day. Now, when the sun comes up and around, it, you, it's harder in the afternoon, but we would right. typically photograph from eight in the morning till 1.30 in the afternoon. And get photos. <laughs> um, another interesting question is about the, um, the carvers. And somebody asked, did the carvers keep inventory of the stones that were shaped, carved, and ready for engraving? Um, or did usually work start on the stone only once the family had ordered it? Great, great question. That's I a think great question. probably what they call bespoke work, which mm -hmm. is where um, the client comes in, has a conversation with the craftsman, and then the work begins. Probably was most of the time. But I think if you're Gershom Bartlett or the Johnsons who had bigger operations, they probably did keep 
um, half finished tablets with a lot of the decoration on hand. And, and we, we don't know, I don't know for sure how that worked. I also think there's no evidence of price lists, you know, which you sometimes find with furniture makers. Right. Where give you a list of all the things that they make and what it costs. Uh, on the other hand, I didn't talk about this, but there are quite a few gravestones actually have a price tag on them. I showed one slide, $40 for marble, 1808. It was back in the presentation. But sometimes the price is underground. I mean, it's, I, I'm not suggesting you start- <laughs> you go to go gravestones, yeah. But, but there is a fair amount of evidence of what these things cost. So when I say a table stone costs 20 times as much as a tablet, that's because we do have some comparison numbers. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, all right, so how about um, one, one more, um, you know, there's a lot of questions about this. So I'm just going to, oh, you know, first I'm gonna throw you a quick one from John. He wants to know, do you have a favorite Puritan carver? Well, I just love Gerson Bartlett. I think he, he's, I, I mean, there are so many that are great. But, and, and certainly the, the um, Benjamin Collins is amazing out in Eastern Connecticut uh, in terms of like folk art. But, you know, well, I don't think this will ever happen, but I, I'll tell this quick little story. When I worked at Wadsworth Athenaeum, my boss wanted to do a, a, a portrait show of, of Picasso portraits. And I said, you know, it would be really fun. Um, if you can get, if you can borrow 10 Picasso portraits, that would be amazing. But let's also put 10 or a dozen portrait gravestones in the same room and, and get them to bounce off each other. And he thought I was nuts, but I, I, I took it one level further. I said, let the audience vote what they like best. I thought that- Yeah, was, there, there yeah. is sort of a, there is a similarity between the two. Well, they are, there is. I think Picasso would have loved this stuff. Uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, but you know, if I had a magic, I would love, uh, to do an exhibit of, uh, 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 there has never been a museum exhibit uh, uh, that was a general overview, not just of Connecticut, but all of New England. I mean, there are books, mm -hmm. but, but, you know, and museums sometimes are phobic about showing photographs of works of art rather than the works of art. Obviously, I mean, you could borrow some stone that people could touch, but basically right. a photograph exhibit, but there are some amazing photographs. Uh, we've taken some good ones, but the Farber collection, gravestone collection at the American Antiquarian Society, all online is a national treasure. And you look at that stuff and you you know those are the highest quality photographs. And I think it, I think the public would go wild if it were carefully curated. Yeah. Um, all right, how about just, just two more questions and we'll, we'll try to keep them quick. One was, um, Again, about gravestone carvers, and uh, the question is, did they travel from town to town? No, I think early on they, they lived near the mm -hmm. quarry sites. And if you wanted a gravestone, you would have to travel to them. I mean, I, I don't think they did. They weren't itinerants, like some of the painters, like Ralph. Right, Perl, like uh, right, Litchfield right. Has wonderful, Litchfield Historical has wonderful Ralph Earl. Well, Ralph Earl had moved around, and he'd mm -hmm. lived with somebody for a week or two and paint there, you know, but um, the gravestone cutters were attached to the quarries until the era of the railroads. And then they had set up their shops in the larger markets. But um, uh, Gershom Bartlett is interesting because he moved and some of them did move, but they didn't, they would move for a long time. They would be one place and then, and anyway, Gershom Bartlett, uh, who was in Connecticut for like 20 years, then moves up into Vermont and becomes one of the first really significant stone cutters working in Vermont. Mm -hmm. He brings the Connecticut style that he was known for here right. up to Vermont. And uh, we, Christine and I discovered this, I don't know if we're gonna get an article on it, we're gonna try to write something about it. <laughs> this, uh, monument up in Hanover, uh, the nephew of the founder of Dartmouth College has a Gershom Bartlett table stone that is just- Oh wow. Made our head explode. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Not only artistically, but this guy was a minister who had had a, a church in, 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 in Bermuda. 
and then another one in South Carolina. And what's he doing up in Hanover in 1770? The college is like two minutes old. And he's up visiting his uncle and he dies. And it's it's a really cool thing that probably nobody in Hanover even knows exists. Even knows about. Yep. All right, so the last question is actually one that we're getting kind of in a lot of different formats. So I'll just ask it sort of this way. Um, you know, if if someone were interested in preservation of grave of gravestones, yeah. are there, re like what resources would you point them to? Well, again, the Association for Gravestone Studies Great. does workshops and conferences to go to one of their conferences some year. I think Ruth Brown with the Connecticut Gravestone Network does restoration and conservation related programs. And I know with this series, are you having uh, Randall Nelson present? Yes, actually, um, Randall Nelson is going to be our next speaker. Oh, good, um, yeah. He's, he's, yeah. Great, and he's done a lot of work in Hartford. I've known him a long. I mean, there are there are other people uh, that do this, uh, that do gravestone restoration and mm -hmm. replication, and um, so that th there are places to get that kind of information. There are yeah. books on it as well. Yes, um, wonderful. Well, um, Bill, this has just been absolutely, absolutely fantastic. Um, well, I'm glad everyone, to see you doing this, yeah. Yeah, um, just to let everyone in our audience know, um, like I just mentioned, we do have a, another lecture coming up on February 9th at 6 p.m. Um, so again, second Tuesday of the month at six, and that is going to be with Randall Nelson, um, who is a um, who works in gravestone repair and restoration. 